Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming today. Uh, we're very proud of this uh, type of activity. Uh, my name is Jack Sprague, and I'm, it's my honor and privilege to serve as president of Bristol Community College. And uh, on behalf of the Bristol uh, Community College family, and also on behalf of Connect, uh, a, a, a wonderful consortium of five institutions, uh, the University of Massachusetts, Bridgewater State University, Cape Cod Community College, Massasoit Community College, all join uh, Bristol Community College in what is a terrific uh, South, Southeastern Mass uh, consortium for education, workforce development, and the wonderful things that happen in the world of education. So I want to uh, uh, thank you uh, for attending. Um, attending college after military service can be somewhat uh, disoriented and disconcerting. It is a whole new world. It's always amazed me as a veteran when we, there, that world in the military has an um, uh, unbelievable array of acronyms and, uh, and uh, shorthand uh, phrases. Uh, yet when veterans are, are uh, coming from that world into, onto the academic campuses, uh, I guess we in the academics can outdo the military in terms of bewildering uh, terminology and uh, uh, all the acronyms that we have. And it's, and it's somewhat disorienting, absolutely. Uh, each of our institutions is committed to providing you with the resources and the connections that you, uh, that you need to make use of your post 9-11 uh, GI Bill benefits. And again, as a veteran, I can say I took advantage. I would never have been able to go to uh, Georgetown Graduate School without, uh, the, uh, without the uh, GI Bill. Um, each of our institutions offers specialized support. I will help you with your paperwork, try to cut through those bewildering uh, vocabulary that we have, um, ad advising, uh, specially customized for the individual veteran, and other outreach services to make uh, the veteran's journey uh, in, uh, into higher education and through higher education and beyond higher education uh, successful. You'll have an opportunity to learn about those services in a few minutes. Uh, a couple of uh, people that I'd like to introduce to you uh, before we start, uh, and one is our uh, executive director of the Connect Group, Kathleen Cur Kirby. Kathleen, if you would uh, raise your hand there. We have uh, Mr. Pedro Amaral, uh, who is representing Senator Michael Roderick's uh, office. Senator is up in Boston, uh, busy on the budget as usual, but uh, uh, I'm very glad that he sends his support, uh, Senator Mike Roderick's. We also have City Councilor uh, David Dennis, Fall River City Councilor David Dennis. And we have a distinguished member of our uh, Bristol Community College Board of Trustees, himself a veteran and a BCC graduate, and along, uh, Joseph Marshall. Joe? Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to also uh, point out to you that we're honored to have uh, the, uh, I, I used to say new chancellor, but she's not new anymore. Uh, uh, we're ha honored to have the chancellor from UMass Dartmouth, Davina Grossman. There's Davina. Thank you so much for coming. And I would like to ask if you could raise your hands, um, those of you who are from Cape Cod Community College. There you go, um, other Connect member. Uh, Massasoit Community College, there we go. Um, uh, uh, Bridgewater State University, and we are honored to have the Vice President Fred Clark, uh, Executive Vice President here. Thank you very much, Fred, for coming. And we have Representative Paul Schmidt, Representative Paul Schmidt, uh, another Thank supporter you, of Veterans Affairs. And uh, last but not least, the members from Bristol Community College. Uh, how about uh, raising your hands? There we go. Thank you very much. We're all very grateful. Uh, these people took time uh, and traveled, uh, some a few buildings away, some many miles away, uh, to come to this. So we're very, uh, very proud of, uh, uh, of the services that we provide our veterans, very proud of the veterans, and we all collectively thank you for your service. We are honored uh, today to be uh, joined by uh, Lieutenant Governor Timothy Murray as host of this special Go Public event. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Murray is the chairman of the Governor's Advisory Council on Veteran Services, which was reestablished by Governor Deval Patrick in April of 2007. Governor Patrick and Lieutenant Governor Murray brought this council back to uh, 
uh, revived it, if you will, to give veterans, their family members, and their advocates a seat at the table. They were literally in the governor's office. Uh, so it shows you the governor, the lieutenant governor, the entire Patrick administration, uh, so much committed to the work of the, uh, of the veterans. This council review, uh, works to review and assess state, federal, and local programs relating to veterans and the delivery of services uh, to the Commonwealth for more than 385,000 veterans in the Commonwealth. Lieutenant Governor Murray's leadership of the Advisory Council as well as his presence at today's event demonstrate the importance that this administration places on the well-being of the Commonwealth for our returning servicemen and women. Uh, I just add a little, another note. Uh, some year, a couple years ago, I attended a veterans uh, uh, event uh, way up in Mount Massachusetts Community College and uh, Gardner, Mass. And uh, Lieutenant Governor was there, sponsored the event, and uh, made clear the priority that there was that he had personally, as well as the Patrick administration uh, for veteran services. Uh, we're very proud of that. And uh, last spring here at Bristol, we hosted a women. Veterans uh, Fair, I guess you'd call it, uh, and it was uh, very successful, highly successful. Uh, women veterans from all over the Commonwealth came uh, to, uh, to Bristol as we celebrated their, uh, their wonderful service. So I'm going on much too long, and it's my honor and privilege uh, now to introduce to you uh, featured speaker, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jack, uh, for your, your service, uh, not only in your service as uh, president of Bristol Community College, but also uh, in the United States Air Force as a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> is, am I right? Thousands of flights uh, in a C-130 in Southeast Asia. So, uh, Jack, uh, thank you. You bring, bring a, a unique understanding uh, uh, of the importance of, of this issue. Uh, and similarly, the people in the South Coast, I think, are, are blessed in that regard in terms of some of the academic leadership. I know uh, President Dana Molafari of Bridgewater State is an Air Force veteran himself. Uh, and the new uh, chancellor at UMass Dartmouth, well, not a veteran. Her dad served uh, in the United States uh, military uh, in the Philippines and is a disabled veteran. So uh, I think understands why uh, we're here today uh, is so important. And it's exciting to see that synergy between uh, the various academic institutions, public academic institutions of higher ed uh, along the South Coast. And uh, I, I also want to recognize uh, Representative Paul Schmidt, who is here, a uh, veteran of the United States Marine Corps. And uh, Thank you, Governor. Uh, he uh, is, is alongside Jack, as well as Coleman Nee, who's our Secretary of Veteran Services and a Marine Corps veteran of the of Desert Storm in, in the Gulf. But uh, we're here this afternoon, and Jack mentioned, uh, President Sprague mentioned, a conversation that started, a couple of conversations. Uh, back in 2006, when Governor Patrick and I were seeking the job, uh, jobs that we both currently serve. We had a meeting, in, in a series of meetings across the state. There were closed-door meetings with veterans from across Massachusetts, about a half dozen of them. And it was in Westfield, Massachusetts, uh, where a group of veterans brought up the issue of the Governor's Advisory Committee on Veteran Services and that how it had existed at one time uh, and had kind of gone dormant. And it was a really an opportunity where the Governor, via executive order, established this and allowed veterans, veterans advocates, families of veterans, people working in education, housing, health care, had a chance uh, 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 on almost a quarterly basis to come to the State House to talk about needs uh, that need to be addressed for our veterans community. So one of the first executive orders that Governor Patrick signed in 2007 was reestablishing re that Governor's Advisory Committee on Veteran Services, and I'm honored that he's asked me to, to chair that. And we have worked uh, full bore with so many partners in this room uh, and from beyond to try to make sure that we are meeting the needs and understanding that every generation of veterans' needs are a little bit different. And so uh, in that regard, our, our, our work here in terms of going public is a chance for people to learn about our Massachusetts public colleges and universities uh, to make sure that our veterans understand that there are support systems and opportunities for them at our, on our campuses. And, 
As President Sprague mentioned, we started this conversation three or four years ago at Mount Wachusett Community College, where we invited all the college presidents of our community colleges, state universities, and the UMass system to come and have a conversation. Because of the good work of people like Congressman Lynch, because of the work of the legislature, you know, we have, uh, the, the, at the federal level, they uh, invested in the GI Bill so that its purchasing power was commensurate with what it was following World War II. And we know what an economic boom that created by empowering veterans with an education. Public campuses, private campuses were full across the country. And with that knowledge and education, our economy transformed not only this country but the world. And so it's that model of success which we've invested in at the state and federal level. And, and, and we want to make sure that as that uh, work and those programs come available at the state and federal level, that there are people on campus who are not just on a part-time basis or kind of when they have a free moment, but people on a full-time basis who are working to support our veterans, are knowledgeable in these programs, and let them know what they and their families have earned access to. And so we uh, celebrate the fact that so many of our, uh, our public uh, colleges and universities have taken advantage of that. And, and, and Jack and, and the team here at Bristol uh, lead the way. And why this is critical, uh, even more so post-World War II, uh, the economy of today demands high-skilled workforce. By 2018, uh, Massachusetts will lead the nation with 70% of all jobs in the state requiring some level of college education. So we look ahead, uh, we have an urgent need to get more adult students into college. You know, getting a, a, an associate, maybe starting off with a certificate program, an industry-recognized credential, and then as uh, they see fit uh, in their jobs that require uh, going on to do more and ultimately completing colleges and degrees. Thanks to the Valor Act, which was signed, Governor Patrick signed this past year, uh, which stands for Veterans Access, uh, Livelihood, Opportunity and Resources, which was approved by the legislature in May of 2012, the Department of Higher Ed will soon uh, issue a statewide policy regarding the awarding of academic credits for military service. The taxpayers of this country and this commonwealth mm -hmm. appropriately so invest uh, uh, significant dollars in training our veterans. Many of those uh, are, are similar to academic programs, so we want to make it as easy as possible for our veterans uh, to navigate and get those credits and not having to go through programs that are redundant uh, in which they've already uh, done so. Uh, together, the Department of, of, of Higher Ed uh, is also, uh, you know, we, we can start the conversation, but the people best able to deliver and most credible on making sure that on every campus, public and private, we've got those support systems in place for our veterans, our veteran students themselves. And uh, we are going to be holding, uh, uh, hopefully this spring, uh, well, we, most definitely this spring, uh, the first Student Veterans Council in Massachusetts. And they will d d draft and present a statewide plan on student veterans issues uh, at the conference. And we are excited about their leadership, uh, continued leadership, I should say, uh, in, in, in advocating for our veterans in our country and together working with our Department of Higher Ed and Department of Veteran Services uh, we are as I said making sure that uh, the congressionally mandated increases in 2009 to the the post 9-11 GI Bill uh, are understood and, and worked on and I just want to ask those members of the Department of Veteran Services and Department of, of Higher Ed that are here, if they could just stand up and be recognized. Because these people have been in Department of Labor and Workforce Training have been working as a team on a regular basis to get this program up and running. If they could just stand and be recognized. And, and, and this is why it's, it's important. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, community colleges, state universities, and the UMass system are currently educating more than half of the 8,500 veterans currently drawing GI benefits in Massachusetts. Uh, and that number will grow as we draw down in, in Iraq and Afghanistan as our veterans come home uh, from various uh, places across the globe and across the country. And so we want to make sure that we've got a system that's supportive and hums and, and gets that information uh, out to people in a timely way. And Bristol Community College has used a Department of, of Labor grant uh, to fund two new campus positions that I mentioned to assist veteran students and they also work with the business community to seek out opportunities for veterans employment and that is another major initiative of the Patrick Murray administration is to make sure that we're educating employers, regional chambers, uh, statewide business associations of the benefits of employing veterans, 
uh, not only the skills and the know-how and the can-do attitude, but also the various tax credits and other types of programs that they uh, <coughs> avail themselves to. This is a partnership. We are the best state in the country uh, uh, in terms of programs that support our veterans and our families, and that's a legacy which people can be proud of. Veterans, veterans advocates, policymakers, legislative leaders, and people of all political stripes. Uh, Governor Patrick and I take that stewardship uh, very serious, but we don't do it alone. We work with our local veteran service officers in cities and towns. Uh, we also uh, get lots of support and funding from our federal government, and there's been few members of the United States Congress who have been more committed to this issue uh, than Congressman Lynch, not only here in Massachusetts, but literally uh, on a, probably over a dozen occasions visited uh, our, our men and women in uniform in places like Iraq and Afghanistan to better understand what they're going through and, and make sure that when they return home they've got the support. So it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch. Thank you, Governor. You're very kind. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Governor Murray. He really has been at the lead of all this, although he is a he has a good partner in, in Coleman Knee in terms of uh, addressing the needs of the veterans in Massachusetts. We have a, we really do have a, a wonderful uh, team here, uh, starting with the governor at the top and uh, with Lieutenant Governor Murray and, and the, the federal delegation. Uh, I'll never forget when I first went to Congress, uh, I was elected in the Democratic primary on September 11, 2001, the day of the attacks. and. Uh, Shortly thereafter, I was sworn into Congress and assigned to the Veterans Affairs Committee. And uh, I remember they had a little reception for me. I, I came in by myself. It wasn't like a big class of people came in. I came in by myself. And Ted Kennedy was there, and he came over, and he said, I want to congratulate you. He said, you've been assigned to the Veterans Affairs Committee. He said, that's the good news. He said, the bad news is they want to close all three of the uh, VA hospitals in the district. So we're going to have to talk. Well, uh, lo and behold, uh, as it all turned out, uh, much to the Senator's credit and the entire Massachusetts delegation, not only were we able to preserve the three VA uh, hospitals in, in my district, uh, Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, and Brockton, but in two of those facilities there are multi-million dollar uh, improvement programs that are underway uh, and, and in the works right now uh, to go forward. So not only will they be preserved, but they will be vastly, vastly improved. Uh, we have a, a, a great network of veterans officers around the state. Uh, I work with them. We all work with them on a daily basis. They're on the ground, and uh, I know there are a few here today. I just want to thank them. Uh, I spent four days a week in Washington, and uh, the veterans agents are really the ones that come to me and let me know what's going on with veterans, if it's a health issue or a housing issue. And uh, the only way that we are effective in Washington, D.C., is because of the the state partners that we have here, including the governor and lieutenant governor, but also our veterans agents who, who are incredibly uh, connected with the needs of, of our, our veterans on the ground. Uh, we've, had, we've had bumps in the road uh, in terms of Washington. I remember when I first came in, uh, we had military folks that qualified for food stamps because their pay levels were so low. Uh, we, we addressed some of that. We had a major scandal at the Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital because of, uh, you know, just substandard conditions that were allowed to exist because we were actually moving to a new hospital. So they didn't want to invest the money in the place we were leaving, but we still had uh, injured soldiers, wounded warriors at that old hospital. So uh, there was a gap there. And uh, I give great credit to uh, Congressman John Tierney, who was the chairman of our, our subcommittee uh, that dealt with that. Uh, and we've had some wins down in Washington. As, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, uh, we, we passed the, uh, well, first we, we passed the largest VA bill in the history of the VA to try to get at some of those pernicious problems like PTSD and, and traumatic brain injury so that we would have the resources to address that. We passed the first, uh, the, the so-called post-9-11 uh, GI bill that really was a, a, a breakthrough and was the best that happened to, to our veterans coming out of the service in a long, long time. But then we also passed the Veterans Fairness Act, which was a series of amendments that tried to better connect our, our veterans with the, the wonderful public universities and colleges that we have so that we can connect them. Uh, you know, 
with the internet now, it's amazing. I, I've been to Iraq now 14 times. I've been to Afghanistan maybe nine times. It'll be 10 uh, in, in, in another couple of months. But uh, they're all plugged in. There's no more, you know, soldiers uh, writing letters home. They're on Skype, they're, you know, so it's, it's instantaneous contact back home. And so I deal with a lot of, I, I have literally sat with thousands of our uh, men and women in uniform who are just about to redeploy back home. And uh, they are hooked in. And it's only because of the resources that are here at home that allow them to really think about what they're going to do next. And uh, the, the state universities and colleges have been tremendous. I actually was with, with a group, uh, it was a striker brigade. We, we went from uh, Kandahar City down to the Pakistani border, a place called Spin Bulldog. So there, there are these uh, uh, strikers. They're like a, it's like a tank on rubber wheels. And uh, so. We, we're, we're cruising through all these villages uh, in, in, in southern Afghanistan right up to the Pakistan border and I happen to be with a young lieutenant from, uh, uh, from Washington State and he was telling me, he said, sir, I want to thank you. He said, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a beneficiary of, the, uh, of the, uh, the new GI Bill and he said, you know, I went to West Point. He said, so I really didn't need the college benefit. He said, but under the bill that you just passed, he said, I have a 17-year-old son uh, who's going to attend Washington State University under my, my GI Bill uh, credits. So he said, I just, that just means the world to me. He said, you know, I'm all, he said, I'm all you know, educated and uh, you know, I, I've pretty much concluded my education. He said, but this ability to hand that to my son or daughter, he said, was just worth the world to me. And, and he said, it lifts a lot of the weight that I had on, on me about their future and, and what the job market and things like that. So that was a wonderful uh, benefit that we were able to extend. Uh, it only works when we have great partners here at home uh, like you. So I want to thank you all. I want to especially thank those in uniform here today for your incredible service to, to our country. And uh, the example that you provide uh, to our sons and daughters overseas, uh, you know, I have been uh, working pretty closely with our team in, in Afghanistan. Uh, I was over there a few months ago. We're rotating folks home. We just, we just brought 23,000 Marines out of Helmand and, and, uh, and uh, Kandahar province. I got to spend some time at Camp Leatherneck, which is the redeployment center uh, for, for our folks coming home. And uh, that's the big question about what to do next and how do I take advantage of the new GI Bill because, you know, my wife and I, we want to get back into the, in, into normal civilian life and we want to have a wonderful life together. And, and in my opinion, they have all earned it. So uh, we cannot get them home fast enough as far as I'm concerned. I know that the president uh, has, has uh, recently announced he wants to re rethink the whole withdrawal process and he would, he would like to expedite it. And I fully support that because the, the function over there now is really educating the Afghans and we don't need a massive military presence to educate the Afghans. So we can get our folks home and uh, <coughs> into your welcome arms and into these programs that, uh, that the state and the state taxpayer has, has so graciously extended. So I want to congratulate you all on the wonderful work you do every day on behalf of my veterans and of all of our sons and daughters in uniform. Uh, thank you so much and, and heartiest thanks uh, to Coleman Nee, uh, who, who does this as well as at, at the be at the behest of Lieutenant Governor Murray and, and, and Governor Patrick. So thank you all very much. I think it's quite evident both in, in word and deed, uh, by, by deed I mean votes and visits, uh, that, that Congressman Lynch uh, is uh, uh, somebody who, who truly understands and uh, really probably no better advocate uh, in the United States Congress for our veterans and, and our family, their families and our military personnel. Uh, you know, we have led the way in Massachusetts on, on lots of fronts and it's because Governor Patrick and I have said this is a priority, but then you need somebody to make sure on a day-to-day -day basis that the teams are working together. And on so many different levels, we are trying to uh, get people uh, in state government and out to work in a collaborative way. Uh, the recent announcement about our ability to reduce uh, homelessness among veterans by 26%, well ahead of the national average, I think is evidence of that collaboration that's taking place. The fact that we're here today uh, and ahead of the curve in terms of 
making sure that our public colleges and, and universities that we've got these support systems in place is because we've got a great team. Uh, that team is led by Coleman Nee and as, uh, as I mentioned, a veteran himself. And he wants to make sure that this system works for those veterans and their families and our military personnel. Secretary Coleman Nee. Thank you so much, um, President Sprague. I appreciate uh, uh, you uh, hosting us here again today. Uh, we had a wonderful event uh, with our Women's Veterans Conference last summer, and, uh, and uh, we are, uh, we're pleased to be joined by our Outstanding Woman Veteran of the Year, the recipient of the Deborah Sampson Award, Karen Smith, uh, Master Sergeant Smith. Women veterans are our fastest growing segment of our veterans population and it really speaks to the, uh, the need that we have today to re-examine uh, fully how we serve veterans and how we serve uh, uh, of all generations, but in particular those gen veterans coming back uh, from today's conflicts and are we doing the right thing and can we, can we do better? And do the systems that we have in place meet their needs? Uh, and our Women's Veterans Network has been, uh, has been uh, at the forefront of uh, of uh, examining that and making sure that we have in place the supports and the services uh, that women veterans uh, uh, need and, and, uh, and that they feel supported as much as, uh, as their brothers in arms. Uh, that uh, is one example, I think, of the, the, the mission uh, that we have been given at the Department of Veteran Services. Uh, that mission comes uh, through the governor, uh, but falls directly on the shoulders of the lieutenant governor who has uh, uh, gladly accepted that and was a strong advocate for veterans uh, when he was mayor of the city of Worcester. Uh, as he's mentioned, he's the chair of the Governor's Advisory Council on Veteran Services. Uh, he's uh, a strong advocate for student veterans. He's a national advocate for veterans now as the chairman of the Lieutenant Governor's uh, Association uh, out of, uh, you know, visiting constantly to, uh, to uh, uh, our educational institutions throughout the Commonwealth and really learning what are the gaps, what are the services, what are the problems. And, and believe me, when, uh, uh, when he gets a phone call about that uh, uh, shortly thereafter, usually uh, uh, about an hour thereafter, we get the phone call and, and we make sure that that gets addressed. And, and uh, the Lieutenant Governor has been uh, a fantastic champion on behalf of the issues of veterans and, and we can't thank him enough for, uh, for providing that leadership. We also get great coordination with our Department of Higher Education uh, and, and, and all of the colleges and universities, but particularly the public institutions. We know a lot of our veterans are coming back here today, taking advantage of their GI Bill benefits and, and really entering the, the academic environment. Uh, for many of them, it's the first time in a long time. Uh, for some of them, uh, the idea that uh, going back to school uh, was something that they may or may not have considered when they, when they first entered the service. But they see the fantastic opportunity that the GI Bill presents, and, 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 and I give a lot of credit to Congressman Lynch and his colleagues for, uh, for ensuring that that uh, new uh, post-9-11 GI Bill passed and that it's as strong as it is. But many of, the, many of those veterans return, and, uh, and, and in fact, I had a brief conversation with our student vets today, and they told me stories that are essentially uh, the same throughout the Commonwealth. That transition can be very jarring. Um, you're going from a military environment, you've been removed from an academic environment for several years, and, and you come into a situation, an environment where uh, most of the people sitting around you uh, not only have not deployed to a combat zone, but have never worn the uniform. And, and in some cases now we're almost generationally coming into situations where their parents never wore the uniform. Many, many of them uh, have to go back to their grandparents in order to find someone who actually, uh, who actually served. And for a lot of our student veterans, that experience we tend to hear can be uh, uh, somewhat isolating and, and, again, a little bit jarring. We want to make sure those folks are supported. And, and, and the Lieutenant Governor, through his work and through his advocacy, has allowed us to stand up our Student Veterans Council. And uh, uh, we have some folks here today uh, uh, from there. Uh, Eric DiGiorgio, who's in the back, is our Executive Director. Eric is a, a Marine, uh, Afghanistan, I believe, yep, uh, OEF Marine. Uh, who uh, is uh, going to Leslie College. And he has really taken a lead on coordinating input and coordinating services from, uh, uh, from student vets throughout the Commonwealth with an idea that, uh, that this uh, committee and that the student vets themselves will provide us with the input we need to figure out where are the gaps, where are the services, what can we be doing better to support you. 
and, uh, and, and, and that work is ongoing, and we look forward to the results, as the Lieutenant Governor said, towards, uh, towards the end of this academic year. Uh, we also have tremendous supports here to help you outside of uh, the academic environment. And uh, one of the uh, signature programs of the department uh, that we've uh, stood up in the last few years is our SAVE program, our Statewide Advocacy for Veterans Empowerment Program. Kevin Lambert, uh, who, uh, who was here, I'm not sure if he's, if he's oh, Kevin is still here, uh, uh, operates that program and oversees our outreach efforts. And SAVE is peer-to-peer -peer outreach. Uh, the SAVE workers are not clinicians. Uh, they're not licensed social workers. Uh, they're, they're, they're simply uh, peers, people who served uh, in uniform, many of them deployed, who understand uh, what the challenges are like. And they're also informed and, and up to date about all of the resources available for veterans. And I encourage any of the veterans here, anyone who's a friend of a veteran here, if you know someone who's having difficulties or barriers, encountering barriers to getting any services, to please talk to Kevin, to please reach out to our SAVE team and they can help them uh, in a way that's really peer-to-peer, vet-to-vet, and, and, uh, and, and high-touch but uh, low pressure so that uh, those veterans can obtain those benefits and services as well. And as well as also, uh, the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, in every city or town, we have a vet service officer. We're the only state in the nation that requires every city or town to have a veteran service officer, and we would strongly encourage you to, uh, to, to, to check in with those folks. Uh, they can help you in a, in, in a multitude of ways from VA claims, uh, if you find, uh, I, I know this probably isn't the case for any of our student vets, but if you find that uh, the GI Bill is uh, slow or there are gaps associated with, uh, with those payments coming, we can, we can help you, uh, we can help you uh, uh, bridge those gaps and, and uh, financially as well as, uh, as, well as uh, help you with uh, opportunities and, and, and other benefits and services that you most assuredly have earned. So uh, we just can't thank you enough. And, and again, uh, I really thank uh, UMass. I thank uh, uh, Bristol uh, for all of the work you've done. But I think uh, the best thing to do is to let you hear it directly uh, from the mouths of those folks that are living this system right now and understand exactly what their experience has been. So I want to, uh, it's, it's my honor, and I believe I can introduce uh, our first student veteran is uh, Jared Oliver. Uh, uh, Jared is uh, uh, attending UMass Dartmouth right now. He's uh, scheduled to receive his degree in May. Uh, he graduated from Fairhaven High School. Uh, he served six years in the United States Air Force and um, uh, you know, assignments at Shaw Air Base and Elgin Air Force Base. And it's my pleasure at this time to introduce for a few remarks uh, Mr. Jared Oliver. That's me. Uh, I'm Jared Oliver. I was born into an Air Force family in uh, Mount Home, Idaho in 1982. Uh, when I was two years old, my father separated and we moved to Lancaster, California. <coughs> we moved back to the uh, South Coast where my parents are from and I graduated from Fred Haven as a bit of fun. Um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I graduated high school, so I uh, actually attended a couple of classes here at BCC, and I worked. But I wasn't really that successful. I wasn't really motivated. I wasn't um, determined to really graduate. I didn't really have a goal. So I uh, contacted um, an Air Force recruiter, talked to them about my options, and off I went. I entered the delayed entry program in August of 2001, and uh, I left for basic in December. <clears throat> Uh, my primary duties while I was in the Air Force was electronic warfare technician. But as anybody who's ever served in the military knows, it's not really just your primary duty that you do, it's a lot more. Um, as a counselor to a young airman who this is their first duty station, I uh, was a physical training leader to the squadrons. I helped develop um, training programs for individuals and groups to uh, meet the standards of the military. Um, the Air Force provided me with uh, the support and confidence that I needed to take the initiative to accomplish any goal that I put forth. <clears throat> I enrolled at the University of South Carolina, yes. South Carolina after I uh, separated. Um, it wasn't really that successful when I was there. I had a lot of, uh, a lot of issues uh, contacting the VA and getting uh, the GI Bill. This is a pre-post-9-11 GI Bill era. 
So I was like right before it was enacted. Um, also had trouble finding classes and contacting my uh, advisor to uh, get the classes I needed for my program. Uh, so it made more sense for me to move back home to here. And I actually had a job waiting for me. So for about a year I worked uh, full time. And um, with the encouragement of my then girlfriend, now wife, I started looking into local colleges to enroll. Um, after talking to uh, a few of the surrounding colleges, I decided to enroll in UMass Dartmouth. I, um, I contacted the uh, chairperson of the economics department, who helped me substantially. He was, he was magnificent. As well as I, con uh, I came in contact with Christina Leonardo, who is our VA liaison. She is spectacular at traversing the, uh, the VA and everything that goes along with the GI Bill. She knows that she knows everything. So uh, once I enrolled, I uh, needed to take it slow to, to ensure I didn't get over my head and uh, put too much on my plate. I enrolled in one night class and uh, two online classes, <clears throat> which provided me with the flexibility I needed to uh, make sure I could still work and attend the classes that I wanted to attend. The first semester was difficult. I, uh, Studying and you know going back to school was, you know, after eight years I think it was, it's, it's, it was tough to actually get back into the swing of things. But with the support that I found through the school, through my family, and through my friends, I ended up doing pretty well. I got two A's in a B. So <clears throat> um, after a few semesters of limited classroom exposure, I started transitioning from full-time worker slash student to a full-time day student and part-time worker. My employer was very um, understanding and allowed me the flexibility I needed to attend the classes that I needed to attend. Um, once I got the hang of studying, I, from uh, beginning slow and not overwhelming myself, um, out of the gate allowed me to develop efficient habits and approaches to studying. Um, the professors were very helpful. They had a lot of um, out of the classroom stuff. Whenever I needed help, I could contact them. They would provide the help I needed. So uh, I'm entering my final year, and I graduate in May. Uh, for the last three semesters, I've been on the chancellor's list. I've been studying very hard. And um, as veterans, my, uh, my approach to most things is unorthodox in the uh, civilian world. I'm usually among the oldest in my classes, but that hasn't really um, been a hindrance. It's more of help to myself and my classmates. They look to me for leadership, and if they need help, they know they can contact me for questions. Um, as veterans, we have a unique skill set that goes beyond our formal training. Regardless of our specialty of individual or individual MOSs, we have uh, we've had experiences that translates to just about any setting that I've encountered. We have uh, determination, leadership, discipline, and the ability to overcome uh, any challenge put forth to us. Thank you. Next student veteran is Ashley Gavin of uh, Massasoit Community College. Yes, Ashley is a native of Brockton and a member of the 772 MP Company uh, Mass Army National Guard. Uh, after completing her military training, she was deployed to Haiti to provide a humanitarian relief and security. And from her experiences of service and deployment, uh, she understands the challenges that veterans face. She's currently pursuing a liberal arts degree with plans to enroll in the Massasoit Nursing Program. Please welcome Ashley. Thank you. Pretty much said it all there, so this really didn't leave me much to say. But um, as I said before, my name is Ashley Gavin. I'm from Brockton, Massachusetts, born and raised. Graduated from Brockton High School, mm -hmm. and then decided to join the Army National Guard. Heard about all the great benefits they have, but. What drew me to the Army National Guard is I wanted to see how hard I could push myself. My father was in the military, my grandfather was in the military, and uh, no woman in my family had done it before. So I figured, okay, well, why not? Let's see what I knew. Mm -hmm. So from there, um, I went to the 772 and then down to the 1140th MP Company in Missouri and found myself shortly after reporting there, found myself in Port au Prince, Haiti. Back in 2011, um, we performed area security and personal security details as well. Um, after moving back up to Massachusetts, 
I remembered that Massachusetts Army National Guard had some great school benefits, and my leadership had told me basically that I was an idiot if I didn't use them. So <laughs> I figured I'd take advantage of those, and I enrolled in Massasoit Community College. What drew me to the school primarily was the nursing program. Um, I'm currently enrolled in the liberal arts science transfer program to try to get into the nursing program. But the veterans program also is what drew me to the school as well. They offered a veterans counselor, a veterans club, and a veterans center. So I found myself feeling a little more comfortable going there with people that I had something in common with and could make the experience a little bit easier adjusting to. When I first started attending the school, I found it very overwhelming. Um, used to being told where to go, what to do. And when you show up there, you're kind of like, all right, well, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> so I contacted Michael Siegel, the veterans counselor, and he, uh, he really helped out. But that's, that's me. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, our next student veteran is uh, uh, Adam McElroy. Uh, Adam uh, is uh, attending Bridgewater State University. Uh, Adam, did I, let's see if my memory is correct. Navy, United Navy. States Navy. Navy. Yep. Thank you. Um, and we had a great conversation with Adam before, prior to this beginning uh, uh, about the issues of transition and about the issues of, of coming back into the classroom environment. And I'm, I'm hopeful you'll expand on some of that as well. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Like I said, uh, my name is Adam McElroy. Um, born uh, in Hanson, went to Whitney Hanson Region High School, graduated in 93. And like everybody, go to college as well. I tried that when I was 18, and I was a great part of and I loved college life, but it wasn't me. So I tried a couple jobs before, didn't work out, and joined the military. So I joined the military in 95 uh, here in Boston, and did 14, 15 years. Uh, got out within my service, I uh, started in boot camp, uh, went to Virginia, at but in the Navy, you travel, so I've been around the world. Um, most of my tours were uh, the Middle East. I spent seven years out there, from Kuwait down to UAE, Oman, Dubai. Uh, did a lot of stuff in Europe, from Italy up to Germany. Um, after that, um, I got out, came back home, and uh, tried a couple of jobs thinking, hands-on experience, I'm going to be good, but nowadays they're looking for a lot of looking for the degree more than hands-on. So I jumped on the uh, post 9-11 GI Bill, got into school, and uh, again, being in the military and uh, training, we think we can almost do anything we put our minds to it, which we can, but with some guidance. So I got in there, and uh, my first point of contact was Arthur Jewett, who was a um, VA at Bridgewater, and he guided me through and got the paperwork and the all the processing stuff going on before the semester started. Got in, and uh, my first day, again, anxiety built up. I thought I was ready. And uh, got out of my car, got there early, like what I was supposed to do. And all these kids were running around, frantically, I thought. And being in the military, when people are running, you're supposed to run with them. <laughs> but I didn't know why I'm supposed to run right now. But then I realized, you know, I got here early. Why, why should I have to run? And then I got to my first class, again, another culture shock with the age difference. I'm sitting in the front now, vice, when I first got there, I was in the back. And, uh, you know, the, the good part of the transition for us is the professionalism that we carry back. Speaking to the professors, understanding the resources that are there for us. And uh, I also got a good, um, good hands-on with my student advisor who had uh, dealt with veterans and police force and stuff. So uh, she was very knowledgeable on each classes I needed to take. Another issue that we have is uh, what classes to take because we're on a budget, not a budget, but a plan on 36 months, 48 months on where to go, not wasting our, our benefits on classes. Well, I had a good um, advisor who knew that. And so she guided me through the classes I needed to be and timing where there was enough space for me to get to class and not rush. So my transition into college was pretty good wasn't as chaotic as some of us have had. Um, I think the, the biggest transition would be the 
thinking, well, for me at least, I went to Bridgewater in 93, didn't make it through. Coming back, thinking I'm going back, am I going to be able to survive it twice? Didn't do it the first time, but I knew I had different skill set, but I didn't really know how to, how to, I don't know, how to put them into use in the civilian world back. So I got there, and with the help again of the author, my student advisor, and my, my professors, and felt I was old enough now where I used the sources with the, the tutoring service, the writing labs, and expressing that I've been out of school for about 15 years. Some of these guys are, you know, students that just came out of high school, understand this curriculum, you know, help me out. And having said that, I got a lot of help. So the transition with the age, the professional we got, the skill set of organization that we have has really helped me in getting into school. So now I'm in Bridgewater, what, my second semester, third semester, doing well. I'm going for my master's in criminal justice, hopefully be done in 2015. <laughs> and, uh, I'm looking, hopefully land it, uh, my career in uh, Homeland Security or NCIS. I worked in with CID, who was part of NCIS when I was in Sicily. I really enjoyed that stuff. So that was my experience. I enjoyed it, both school and military. Uh, tough transition, but you know, I think, like all of us in the military, we can get through it and adapt to anything. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jared and Adam and Ashley. Uh, uh, you heard uh, just some of the value uh, that the military service brings to people and our veterans when they come on the campus. Uh, uh, I've said publicly my, in my own personal uh, experience, uh, you know that old uh, book, uh, Everything I Learned, I Learned in Kindergarten? Uh, and just about everything I learned, I learned in the military. How to be responsible, how to be professional, and you've heard the three uh, uh, veterans speak uh, so well and eloquently about uh, the value of their service. Um, and something that they didn't uh, necessarily appreciate, I think, uh, you heard uh, Jared and uh, Adam say a little bit about it, uh, the other students look up to them. Uh, they come as natural leaders. I mean, 8 o'clock class starts at 8 o'clock. What's the problem? And uh, they're there at quarter of 8, ready to roll. Uh, and, uh, and their behavior, there uh, is, uh, I hate to use the word professional, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a responsible, uh, they're a great model for our, uh, for the rest of our students uh, on each of our campuses. Uh, I'm very grateful to the to the veteran students uh, here at uh, at Bristol, and I know the other uh, uh, c c campuses and universities all uh, all mean that all feel the same way. It's really spectacular. Um, so uh, we're going to have a little uh, time for question and answer at this point. Uh, you've got a great array of talent here, and the Lieutenant Governor, Secretary Nee, and Congressman Lynch. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, the service tables out uh, in the hallway uh, for you to pick up any, uh, any information that you might need, as well as the two rooms just directly across the hall uh, in which there are myths and misperceptions about the benefits, as well as uh, careers that pay. Uh, those are two uh, uh, workshops specifically designed for, uh, for veterans. And we're running a little late, so I want to be sure that you still have a chance. Uh, this, is a, this is a terrific uh, group for you to ask questions about if there are any uh, veterans and students that uh, uh, would like to know anything, any question that came up, something you heard today, something that's been on your mind. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh my name is Greg, I work with Veterans Upper Bound, and although the, the, the new um, uh, veterans that are being uh, uh, redeployed have a tremendous amount of bene benefits available to them. The big hole in the benefit system, I think, has been addressed recently by VRAP, and I have a lot of my veterans that I'm talking to that are applying for it, and I'd like to know how is it being received? Is the future, is it going to be refunded again? Uh, it seems like it's the only for a lot of the 35 to 50 year old veterans that are having tough times right now. Well, as you know, let, let me try to take a swipe at it. As you know, uh, we're currently in negotiations about this so-called sequestration uh, process, which is really budget cuts uh, that are right now projected to occur across, across the budget, you know, 
A is for agriculture, you know, Z is for zoology. Everything gets cut between 7 and 10%. Uh, we did put in language that would protect, hold harmless the VA uh, and, and, and veterans programs. So I am hopeful that that language will, will prevent any, any reductions so that we can basically, even through continuing resolutions, continue to fund things at existing levels. I don't know about the ability to raise additional revenue, even though it may be needed, especially with more folks coming back. They say, well, obviously, we, you know, if we're going to bring down, we went from 165,000 troops in Iraq, we're down now to about 5,000, 5,000 instead of 165,000. So we got all those folks coming back into the system. We were at uh, about 120,000 in Afghanistan. We're at 66 now. But now the president is talking about accelerating the withdrawal process there, uh, and so we, we we cannot we cannot absorb that large an influx in need without without you know providing some more uh, resources to, to help those folks. So we're we're sort of we're holding our own right now, and uh, we'll do our best to try to uh, realign resources to meet to meet the need, but uh, uh, stay tuned. I think uh, over the next 60 days, we're going to have to figure out, uh, you know, what areas are going to be cut. And uh, as I said before, we did put specific language in. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats don't agree on, a, agree on a lot down there, but we did agree that, you know, whatever cuts were coming, they, they should not come from uh, the veterans. The average age of our veteran in our program is 35 to 45 to 50. That's really important. We're really struggling to try to identify benefit opportunities for that, for that age group. And the VRAP is really a, a, a very helpful at this time. I hear you. I hear you. And I, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, and Gray, I just wanted to make note for, uh, for those veterans that are looking for workforce training programs, and one of the strongest partnerships we have at DVS with the Department of Labor, and a number of folks are here from the Department of Labor as well. There are, um, uh, if, in the interim, if that's if they experience any gaps, I really would recommend that those folks go out and see their career centers, uh, their vet reps and DVOPs and leavers, and also for any of them that, that have uh, any type of service-connected disability, become involved with the VA and look at vocational rehab options as well. Well, I thank you very much. I wanted to recognize Paul Hart up there for the Fall River School Committee. Paul, do you have a question as well? Anyone? No? Go ahead. Quick question, sir. Yes. Uh, I actually, just a comment. My name is Tony O'Brien. I'm the district commander for the VFW. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony Governor Murray and uh, the secretary and Congressman Lynch um, for being here today, and especially the school. Uh, and I also want to recognize my state commander, uh, Tim Smith, who's up there talking to kids. Um, for the folks that don't know, that are, that are here or, or not here. Um, and when we talked about it a little bit earlier, the Secretary talked about it with regards to having a VSO in every town. And I think you mentioned that we're the only state that requires that. There is a tremendous amount of benefits, uh, whether they be employment, whether they be health care, whether they be education, um, et, et cetera, and the, the VSO type of outreach and access that we have in the state. If folks don't realize. This state is one of the best, if not the best state. I'm not trying to do a commercial, it's just a fact. <laughs> I mean, you could make the list, we don't have the time. Um, but we, we, it is one of the best states, if not the best state in the country for veterans benefits. And I just want to salute you for being here today, and you three leaders and the other leaders that you work with um, in both state and federal government are a big reason for that, and uh, we can't thank you enough, so thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Just uh, thank you for that plug, uh, and it's a great uh, uh, intro just to, to one piece. I just want to make sure, again, people have the information, and please share with as many people as you can. But actually, we're at Bunker Hill Community College, where we rolled out uh, the, mass, the, 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 the web portal for uh, people to understand what benefits they've earned access to, or a family member, or a friend, or a coworker. So it's Mass Vet uh, Advisors. MassVetAdvisor.org. So literally, you, you can put in branch of service, uh, uh, years of service, you know, uh, various information. So it will take that menu and collapse it down specifically for you, uh, whether it be education, healthcare, 
uh, you name it, uh, and, you know, financial, other types of things, to, to, to let you know what you've earned access to, or, or a family member, or a coworker, or a friend. So it's the first in the country. It was a partnership with the uh, Mass Technology Collaborative, uh, Mass, Broadband. Mass Broadband Institute, and, and so we're extremely proud of it. And it's a, a tool, as the Congressman said, that's the way uh, people today communicate and, and, and gather information. And so please uh, spread the word on that. Thank you very much. As you can imagine, uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about. We're very uh, lucky to have uh, uh, the three wonderful people who came and shared their time from their busy schedule. It shows their commitment to Veterans Affairs, uh, and we're very grateful to them. Once again, I also want to mention that we're grateful to the Connect Consortium. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about it in terms of veteran services as well as other uh, uh, categories of in the education world. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chancellor Davina Grossman for coming, UMass, Executive Vice President Fred Clark on behalf of uh, President Dana Molaferia from Bridgewater State University. I know that uh, John Cox, President of uh, Cape Cod Community College, uh, and Charles Wall, President of Massasoit Community College, all join with me to thank you for coming. Uh, we're very, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for Bristol uh, to, uh, uh, to host this event. Remember there are veteran services and tables out there, uh, and also that uh, there are a couple of good uh, uh, programs uh, in L120 and L119 about either misperceptions uh, uh, about the, uh, 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 your educational benefits as a veteran, as well as career planning. And those dedicated, uh, you're gonna meet some of those dedicated veteran service officers uh, uh, working on the tables out in the hallway so please, please take advantage of their expertise. I thank you for coming, and I look forward to uh, seeing you again in many, many more veteran services uh, conferences and uh, events.